But <laughs> but yet, if you say what the greatest horror film of all time, it's like, oh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, right? So, oh. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's phenomenal. And, and what a wonderful gift to have in life, you know, to be chosen at 23 years old, to be chosen, given that opportunity, a golden opportunity. Hello, everyone. I hope you're all having a wonderful day today. My name is Talal, and you are listening to the Popcorn and Soda Podcast, the show where we discuss all things movies, pop culture, and so much more. I want to thank each and every one of you for making me a small part of your day. On today's show, we are joined by a very special guest. He is one of the finest cinematographers of the last four decades with having shot over 400 music videos and 250 commercials. He was the man behind one of the most iconic horror movie films of all time, 1974's The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, another amazing cinematography feat to his name. With the movie celebrating its 47th year anniversary, it continues to inspire the next generation of filmmakers, actors, and cinematographers. On the show today, the very talented, award-winning, Mr. Daniel Pearl. How are you, Daniel? Very good. Thank you, Talal. Nice to meet you. Nice to be here and uh, be on your show. My pleasure. Thank you so much for coming to hang out on the show. And before we deep dive, uh, how have you been over the last four, uh, last year, actually? We're living in such a crazy uh, good, world. Good. You know, I mean, uh, um, sort of before in the several months prior to the uh, pandemic, uh, I started working a lot with the director, Joseph Kahn, and uh, he's continued to get jobs uh, and um, He's sort of, uh, you know, he and I hook up on jobs in bizarre places, Prague. Uh, last month it was uh, uh, Santiago, Chile. But uh, so that's, that's interesting and exciting. Um, we're allowed to travel. You know, I'm not sure that I agree with it, but you're allowed to travel if it's for work. Um, yeah. So you can go and, you know, I can go, I can go to Santiago, Chile. I mean, we had very strict uh, protocol pandemic. We were quarantined for seven full days 168 hours at which point we were given a uh a pcr test I had to wait another 20 20 hours before we were allowed to leave our hotel rooms we were stuck in our hotel rooms for eight days down there but uh um to return to los angeles and everyone's given a piece of paper saying that you have to quarantine for two weeks unless you've been working if you've been oh, working really? fine. yeah now i i happen to be you know, my, I'm very concerned about uh, bringing the uh, COVID back to We mean, isolated in our house. We have, a, mm -hmm. unfortunately, live in a big house, and I can stay in one wing of the house. Uh, and you know, if I leave that wing, I wear a mask. If I leave the wing, everybody else in the house wears a mask. And uh, for five days, at which point I get tested, and then I'm negative, and then I'm officially home again. So I did go through that, but uh, but anyhow. Um, What's been great about it is I did, like I said to you, I did hook up and shoot quite a bit of stuff with Joseph Kahn. Not everything, but uh, a lot of the stuff that I find interesting anyhow that, that we do together. Uh, and in, always an interesting locales, always all over the world. Uh, and um, so I've been good. You know, uh, my wife's going crazy. She goes, you know, <laughs> hey man, you know, she goes, I haven't been able to go off the block, but you've been to Prague, you've been to Santiago, Chile, you've been all, all over the world. <laughs> Even all every everywhere, and I've been stuck here. Uh, well, you know, I'm sorry. I don't know what to tell you. It's just uh, the world we're living in right now, right? It's yeah. just uh, it's it's a crazy time in the history <laughs> of uh, everything. It's a crazy uh, time, and you know, uh, uh, as you said, you know, I've, for, I've shot a film that's got its 47th anniversary uh, this year. So um, uh, obviously, I've been at it for a while. Yeah. And uh, but I don't know what I would do if I was a young cinematographer uh, starting out right now. I'd be freaking the fuck out, man. I'd be going crazy because it's like this is valuable time, especially you got it going and you know you're you're in there and everybody knows your name and you're, you're you got a you know a late great piece of work out there that's got you on everybody's brain, and then you're just letting all this time for that to dissipate. So yeah. uh, I mean it's it's good because it's it's so, you know works going again not not going at the speed that it was going before but mm -hmm. i think uh, i'm very optimistic about the vaccine i think that as we get a good 
percentage of the population vaccinated, I think, you know, we have a chance of returning to a somewhat a resemblance of normal. Right. A new normal or whatever you want to call it at this it's point, right? Be, you know, it's not going to be the old thing for sure. Oh, that, and and uh, it's, uh, unfortunately, it's going to be the new normal uh, in filmmaking as usual, but will be at the expense of the crew as it always is. Yeah. Uh, so we'll just happen to see what happens, uh, as you mentioned, with the vaccine rolling out this year and hopefully enough people take it. But mm -hmm. it's one of those things where cinema and filmmaking is going to look radically different because now a lot of these studios are going to be able to say, all right, do we really need X amount of people on set? Do we really need this person, that person, that person? There's, there's a lot of that, you know, CDC dictates, you know, how many people should be in a room at a time, uh, yeah. used to, uh, you know. And uh, so there's a lot of that absolutely um, going on. And, you know, the films are, films are changing a lot too. I mean, you know, because of, of what, the way we can shoot them and the way people can interact with each other mm -hmm. during these times, you know, unless they're willing to go through a quarantine and be yeah. you know, in a bubble, make a film in a bubble. You know, you can do that, I guess, but uh, it's- I guess it's, we'll just see what happens, right? To well, here's, here's a huge thing, huge, huge, huge thing that came about now people may get around it by well i guess they can't even get around it by leaving california atmospheric smoke yeah atmospheric smoke has been ruled out by the screen actors guild um not so much because of the direct effects of the smoke which still would be a bad idea because you're talking about respiratory diseases respiratory, yeah. excuse me okay. absolutely bad idea if you're talking about respiratory diseases and doing anything to your lungs uh, at a time of respiratory disease or respiratory pandemic is a bad idea um but uh the more important effect of of smoke is that when we smoke up a set we button it up you know we would close that door. there's all these things close that door keep that window shut what the fuck you know yeah god damn it no one allowed in or out or, you know block off the entrances don't let anybody in or out we need yeah. to keep the smoke level well that is the antithesis of what they want you to do in a time of a respiratory pandemic. They want to keep the air circulating, going through a filtration, and you want to be turning that over, that air over, way more quickly than you would in a normal situation. So consequently, uh, atmospheric smoke is out the window, and that is huge to a cinematographer. It's a gigantic tool that we have of, 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 of creating a mood, way you know smoke catches the light it diffuses the lenses i mean it, it works for us in so many ways yeah. softens the image somewhat uh softens the light for sure picks up the light becomes provides its own fill light the bounce off of the smoke becomes a, an element and um you know overall lowers contrast in, in situations which is uh which is, you know, probably it's a massive tool. Yeah. It's just like how actors have their range and different just forms of acting. You guys have all these things to your repertoire. And now when that's being taken away, it's just, uh, you can just uh, imagine. Uh, that, that's a valuable one. I mean, like almost always shoot everything with smoke. You know, wow. I mean, it's like, you know, all the time, gotta, you know, smoke, 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 you gotta have it. And uh, not, not anymore, at least not yeah. for a while. I guess not, but hey, uh, here's hoping to uh, a better 2022 and hopefully these things will somewhat return to normal. Um, you've had such an amazing journey and a fascinating career. Before we dive into all things Texas Chainsaw, I, I just, I'm so interested, where does this all begin? What were some of your early influences and what made you want to be in the creative arts? All right, well, uh, to be honest with you, I had no idea about it, although I did dabble uh, with cinematography, just not even, I, I didn't even know the word cinematography existed at the time. When I was 13, my buddies and I all got our skateboards. We, we mailed off checks, I guess, in those days to, uh, to the, to the West coast, to Cali and, uh, got skateboards. And we, we lived in a very hilly town with that had just recently repaved the streets. So they were smooth. And, um, we just hung on our skateboards all the time. And after about six months of that, got pretty good on a skateboard. I don't even know what motivated me, but I decided to go into Manhattan uh, and uh, buy a eight millimeter movie camera. And I began right. to shoot films of my, my friends. Um, did that for about four or five months on the weekends. They'd come over to my house. I did, wouldn't, we did, weren't telling a story or anything. I just try and make cool shots of them skateboarding. Yeah. And um, 
I cut out the, the flash frames and where I reloaded the, the, the film and the camera and, you know, keep it long. We didn't really edit it. But I had a little mm -hmm. sort of simple editing machine and a little viewer and they'd come over to my house and we watched the, the films that, that basically were assemblies rather than edits really just were footage assembled and uh, listen to Beach Boys records. And, you know, imagine that we were uh, big time surfers in, in California. Uh, you know, so uh, did that for a long time, put it away. Uh, when it came time to go to college, uh, first of all, my father uh, had attended the University of Texas. He grew up in a um, in a Russian Jewish uh, immigrant uh, enclave that he was born in the United States uh, in the Bronx, uh, is where he, where he grew up. But he, he's like, why am I living with all these people? You know, I'm an American. I'm born in America. I'm, I'm yeah. going to go see this country. And so he hops on a train and goes to Texas. Took him five days. He like. He was like going to the to the frontier. I, you know, imagine he was going to be going, you know, wild west and the whole thing. And it, it was the '30s. It was pretty wild. Not as wild as he imagined, but it still was a pretty wild place, Texas. Anyhow, my father just always thought that um, Texas uh, there was an important energy that Texans had. You know, sort of a way they grabbed, the, literally grabbed the life by the horns. Yeah. You know, and um, he wanted both my brother and I to experience that. So I was sent off to the University of Texas, which happened to be, you'll see later in the story, quite a fortuitous thing to have happened to me, to put me into Texas. I uh, went there in uh, 1967. Uh, the Vietnamese war was raging. Uh, everybody was protesting the war in Vietnam. We were quite a divided nation at that time. It's kind of the way we are now, only that the division was not yeah. quite stupid as it is now in my opinion but anyhow we were a divided nation very much so uh and uh everyone who wanted to uh protest the war in vietnam would bring in 16 millimeter prints uh, of the of the classic films oh no way yeah. cinema kurosawa fellini bergman on and on and on and on Truffaut. i mean you name it dyer everybody all the, all the great films now what was incredible about this was that I'd never seen any of these films, right? Because you have to realize videotape doesn't exist yet, right? So the only way you're gonna see one of these films is if you happen to be in a major city, because they didn't show in every every city in, right. the, you know, in the United States, New York, Chicago, Los Angeles. That was about it, I think, where these films would show. So unless you were in one of those cities, the one week that they ran, because also films only ran a week in those days because there weren't multi-screen theaters. Yep. And so they had a, a single feature or double feature bill that they ran for a week and they changed it the next week. And that was it. People just went to their local cinema, you know, like as my brother and I as children, we'd be dropped off at the cinema um, by our parents, you know, and, you know, parents would go do whatever they would do for on a Saturday and we'd, we'd wind up, you know, spending four or five hours at the cinema watching a double double feature you know in those days films just didn't stick around they just only only ran for a week so so for a dollar or two dollars on the expensive ones i could go see a very good quality 16 millimeter print and these showed and i would sometimes sometimes i'd watch two a day but i'd watch one at least one every day and i didn't give a i didn't give a shit about my classes did not care about it, it wasn't interesting to me at all but these, I was fascinated by these films, particularly like uh, last year at Marienbad, uh, Seven Samurai, awesome. Seven, uh, you know, Eight and a Half. I mean, these films, you have to also keep in, keep in mind that the same thing is that the whole hippie thing, the whole psychedelic thing is, is starting to ramp up at the same time, right? Yeah. So to see these films that were, in a way, they were foreign films, so they're a bit of a psychedelic experience to start with. The fact that they were foreign films that were made in a different style, you know, they, they were subtitled, um, you know, and they were just, and, you know, it, it was just incredible. I mean, you know, even the films of uh, Bicycle Thief and Tony Oni and, and, you know, and, and, and Rossellini and, and, and all the other, you know, incredible um, Italian directors. It was, you know, it was just a phenomenal time. So, after a year of doing this and not really caring about my classes, my grades were not such that I was going to be able to remain uh, to keep my student deferment at the University of Texas, which uh, which would keep me out of, out of Vietnam. And gotcha. uh, it's very important that I do not that to yeah. me that I don't wind up in Vietnam even and and um, 
that became even more so once I decided to be a cinematographer because the last thing on earth I wanted to do would be walking backwards with a camera on my shoulder filming the, the troops as they came out of the helicopter or off, out of the yeah, you know, landing yeah. craft or whatever to be documenting the war. It was the last thing I wanted. You know, I didn't want to be in the war. And if I did wind up in the war, I certainly didn't want to be documenting it without, you know, not, not aware of what was going on. So anyhow, um, I'm sitting there trying to decide what to do after two semesters of not very good grades. And I'm flipping through the course book. And uh, I met a very good friend of mine's uh, apartment, a guy named Ted Nicolau, who uh, later on, Ted, Ted and I went on to make a lot of films together. And in fact, uh, I was able to get Ted recommended to be the sound recordist on the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. So uh, Ted and I have had a, quite a good career. He went on to become a, a director himself and actually directs uh, a little bunch of horror films. Um, but uh, I was at his apartment flipping through the course book, going, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? <laughs> Something that interests me. And I come upon a department of radio, television, and film. And I go, Ted, there's a film school here. And he goes, what can they teach you in the film school? I go, I don't know, but I'm going. Uh, so I, I went to film school, signed up in the film school. We made a uh, project together. We shot a Western that I shot and I killed it. I, you know, I uh, was sitting there the first day in, in the class and they go, all right, uh, we're gonna, we're gonna, first of all, no one's gonna get in the film business, forget it, it's closed business, it's father to son, nobody breaks into it. If that's important to you, forget about it, it's not gonna happen. Mm -hmm. So about half the class got up and left. Now there's about 10 or 11 of us left in the class. He goes, okay, we got rid of the people who are serious about this. So now we're gonna, um, we're gonna make a Western. And anybody ever work a, 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 a a film camera before so i go you know, i think of my eight yeah. millimeter camera. I go, yeah i have okay you'll be the cinematographer well what unbeknownst to me you know in cinematography less so today now that it's digital because you can see the results pretty much on the screen yeah. but in those days we didn't see things sometimes for days or a week later wow. at the very least it would be overnight you get the lab the film would have to be processed overnight that was a, the shortest turnaround we had was overnight but sometimes if you're on location, it might be days or a week that you see anything. So a lot more had to go on uh, uh, in our brains. You know, a lot of the math. So it was required. We had to do a lot of math. We had, we had to know a lot of science. Um, All the fun stuff, right? <laughs> still, well, you know, it happens to turn out is the thing that I'm strong at. So, um, you know, what I want to tell you is, is that... Uh, some, you know, what makes cinematographers, we are unique as individuals and as a certain skill set that we have that like it's become a little bit less of a situation, but still by and large holds true that um, a lot of people are strong in art, but useless in math science. A lot of people are strong in math science and useless in art. We cinematographers happen to have a foot in each because we have to, we're, we're artists, but we're creating in a very technical art form. Right. Uh, our end of it is very, very technical. It was, it was, was so particularly so when it was filmed. Very, very uh, technical situation. Um, now you can see it. A lot of people know what's going on. A lot of people can, you know, can 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 help you out and, and tell you what's going on with it. And there's all kinds of histograms and all kinds of things to, uh, you know, to show you uh, what what the results are, are like, rather than waiting to see it come back. Mm -hmm. um, but. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, so that that's a very important thing that cinematographers have that a foot in each, both the art world and in the math science world. And I'm very fortunate that my parents set me up with that. My father is a mechanical engineer, quite a good mechanical engineer. And my mother was a painter. And so they gave me, I get both, I get the art side from, from, both worlds. from math science from math science side from my father. And away I go, a, a left-handed, uh, you know, problem student who uh, <laughs> has some gifts. So, <laughs> well, that's just just the beauty of life, right? Where you got the best of both worlds, and you were able to take both things and mesh it into your personality and things that work for you, and right. that led to so much amazing work. And talking about the amazing work, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. This movie is just so iconic, and it continues to live on generation after generation. But no, it's phenomenal. it's phenomenal, isn't it? I mean, it blows my mind. And that, it, it's, it's crazy because... We, uh, so I, I, I worked on it, right? So obviously I'm in tune with a lot of what goes on about it, right? Yeah. Well, you didn't work on it, but you know that 
people are talking about it all the time everywhere right and absolutely it, i mean my perception of that is like it is talked about more than say a film that won the academy award five years ago or 10 years ago it's like who you know nobody knows what well who was that who you know what film won the academy award even like last five year, years ago, 10 years ago. Yeah, no one talks about those things, <laughs> no right? Knows, right? But, but yet, if you say what the greatest horror film of all time, there we go, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, right? So, oh. you know, it's, it's, it's phenomenal. And, and what a wonderful gift to have in life, you know, to be chosen at 23 years old, to be chosen, given that opportunity, a golden opportunity. I mean, you know, you've mentioned that I've done, that I've, you know, hit a lot of home runs in my time. I made, you know, I, that's what I refer to them as, you know, killer, probably when you really kill it, and it's a well-known piece. Absolutely, yeah. Chapter, you know, and, um, you know, and I've been blessed because, you know, as a cinematographer, you don't write these things, you don't direct them, you don't cast them, you just shoot them. And you just got to be really blessed to be chosen to, to have these opportunities, you know, and I, and I am blessed that that's, that's happened for me many, many, many times throughout my career. And, uh, Absolutely. And what so I, I was just talking about the importance of this movie. And it's something that is just part of pop culture cinema. It, it, it really is. It, we talk about movies that won Oscars a year ago, two years. Most of people don't talk about it. But this movie resonates. And just even the name, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, like what's <laughs> that's just like, whoa, what's this? <laughs> I know the name, you know, we shot it under the name on the title Leatherface. Yeah. And that's you know what? We shot it under. And when Toby told us that it was going to be called the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, it was right near the end of the shooting. And I'm like, oh, man, that's a terrible idea. Well, we were wrong. <laughs> but, you know, obviously, it was a fantastic uh, title. In hindsight, yeah, that's one of the biggest draws to this movie. So, and none of this amazing pop culture iconography or just the way this character has lived on would have been possible if it wasn't for that original movie. So, let's dive right into pre production, production, and post. What was okay. your introduction to this entire concept of Leatherface at the time, Texas Chainsaw? And well, it, it starts with, uh, you know, as I told you in the beginning, uh, at film school, mm -hmm. they told us that we couldn't get into the film industry. It was a closed industry, which it was at that time. I mean, there were only three studios, three networks. Chicago, New York had two independent channels. Chicago had one. That was it. Right. Austin, Texas, where I was going to film school, we didn't even have all three networks. We had only the two of the three networks. Oh, wow. And uh, we had only two stations. Um, but uh, they, so what they told us at that time was that you're not going to get into film school. I are mean, not going to get into the film industry. So if you're really into it, you'll stay on, you'll study, you'll go to graduate school, you get a master's degree, maybe you get a PhD, maybe not in film technique, film theory. Uh, and if you're lucky, very lucky, you'll get grants and you'll make films on the weekends or the summers, but that's it. Forget it. You're not going to wind up in Hollywood in the film industry. It's just a closed industry. So keeping with that in mind, I did go through, I'll get my undergraduate degree and I did choose, long story I'll leave out, but I did decide to remain at the University, University of Texas to shoot the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which, I mean, excuse me, I did decide to remain at the University of Texas to get my master's degree which worked out to be a fantastic thing because it put me in, left me in a position to be hired for the Texas Chainsaw. I bet, yeah. Now, mm -hmm. at the time that we finished getting our master's degrees, and again, Ted Nicolau, who I mentioned before, was a good friend of mine, and several other guys that were in that class, uh, they were all directing students, and I shot all their films. I was a cinematographer. So I'm just, you know, shooting, like, every year, I'm shooting, like, an hour's worth of student films at least every year. So... Um, uh, my second year in, in graduate school, uh, I started shooting commercials for the for a guy named Larry Carroll, who was became a partner with us later, and he wound up being an editor on Texas Chainsaw Massacre. When Larry was graduated a year ahead of us, and so he started to get professional jobs in Texas, and I started right. to shoot to, he started to hire me to shoot those jobs for him. So I started to have a bit of get some stuff out on television, and uh, you know people could start to see my work. And uh, I, when we graduated, I told my buddies that I, that I went all the way through, through the graduate program with, really through film school with these same, same eight, seven, eight guys. Um, I said, you know, guys, I think I'm pretty good at this. I will shoot a feature film by the time I'm 35. I'll be the youngest cinematographer to ever shoot a feature film that anybody's ever heard of. And they all go, that's some pretty bullshit. I go, yeah, I know it is, but I, I think I'm good <laughs> at this. I think I can pull it off. 
Um, three weeks later, the phone rings. It's Toby Hooper. And I, I, I kind of have to imitate Toby. Oh, Dan old man, uh, uh, my name's Toby Hooper, and I'm a, I'm, I'm a, uh, uh, I'm, I'm doing a little film here, and uh, I've seen some of your work, and I, I reckon you're the best cinematographer in Texas, and uh, I want you to shoot my film. Well, I'm sitting there with mind blown. I, I, yeah, sure, man. I, just for some reason, I don't know why I decided to play it cool. I go, yeah, man, uh, let me see the script. You know, I hang up the phone. <laughs> uh, two of my buddies were at my place at that time. I go over, I go, ah, oh, guys, fuck, I go, I'm 12 years ahead of schedule. <laughs> <laughs> you spoke it into existence. <laughs> I, you know, oh, Jesus Christ, I'm 12 years ahead of schedule. And uh, I go, what's going on? So I just been asked to shoot a movie. And they go, what kind of movie? I said, I don't know. It's a, I guess it's a horror film of some kind. I don't know. I'm going to have to read the script. Well, you got to keep in mind, 1973, you don't get a script like that like you do. Today, today you say, I want to read a script. Boom, it's there. Maybe you have to sign an NDA first, but the script's there in, in minutes for you. Well, this, I had to wait for them to make a copy of the script. They had to mimeograph, make a copy on a copy machine, you know, and then, and then you know, somebody had to deliver it to me in person. So a couple of days transpired. Uh, and then, uh, you know, I read it and it was incredible. It was, it was so strong on paper. And, uh, you know, I mean, I call back, I go, yeah, man, uh, yeah, I like it, uh, Toby, I like it a lot, I'd like to shoot it for you. And I'm thinking to myself, these guys are crazy, I'm 23 years old. I mean, they are completely insane. I wouldn't hire a 23-year-old cinematographer to, to, uh, to shoot this film for me. This is completely nuts. So anyhow, so I ring Toby back, oh, yeah, I'd like, I'd like to shoot it, man, when do we start? And I'm thinking, they're crazy hiring a kid to shoot this film. I mean, it's a golden opportunity. I need this opportunity. Well, I'm not going to walk away from it, but I, I wouldn't hire me. They're crazy. <laughs> so anyhow, he goes, oh, Daniel, man, uh, you know, we got, uh, we're shooting this film for $80,000, making a film for $80,000. And uh, we got $70,000. There's, there's an oil lobbyist here. I got oil lobbyists. I go, you know, lobbyists like that's that's the enemy, Toby. Because yeah, man, I know that I know that I know that's the enemy. But we're you know we're a bunch of hippies. We ain't got no money. Yeah. And the enemy, they got money. You know. <laughs> so so uh, all right. Well, we understand. We need our benefactors if we're gonna you know if we're gonna make films. We need we need people. It's an expensive process. And we need people who are gonna give us money right. to do something. So okay. So he goes. So anyhow, uh, but he this this guy who gave us the money, he wants to make sure he's not the only guy that believes in this project. So he's only given us 70 of the 80,000. So as soon as we get the other 10,000, we're gonna go. Well, I hung up the phone, thought to myself, what the hell is gonna happen? It's gonna sit on the vine. It's not gonna get, you know, it's gonna sit around for a long time. Right, and yeah. I'm thinking either Vilmo Zygmunt or Laszlo Kovacs are gonna wind up shooting this film. They were 37 and 38 years old at that time, right? And uh, of course, we later on became friends with both of those guys and we had a good laugh when I told them I was afraid they were going to shoot my film. Um, the Vilmo spoke, he said, uh, he said, well, I'd already shot McCabe and Mrs. Miller. Somebody offered me to Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I would have had to say no. He goes, but Laszlo absolutely would have said yes. Laszlo definitely would have stole your job. <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow, uh, uh, I hung up the phone and, and I'm sitting there thinking, oh my God. And I realized, remembered I had a friend who had quite a bit of money. He was, parents had a, had a big ranch and he, he had a lot of money uh, and he was interested in film he had dropped out of film school but we occasionally would go to the cinema together he'd bring me out every three or four months and we'd go right, see it right so i rang him up i said listen i've been asked to, to shoot a film and you know you might you go oh he's like oh, well all right you know gotta bring me the script whatever you know. calls me back three hours later how much can i put in he's like all excited <laughs> you know and i go ten thousand only ten thousand well the ten thousand proved to be incredible because he was our foil. Whenever um, the oil lobbyists tried to get us under under his thumb, right? Too much, you know, we thought he was cramping our style too much. Toby said, would you like your money back? And we'll just get you, you know, we'll have your money back here shortly if, if you want your money back. And he go, no, 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 no. So that was a that was a very uh, great thing that happened. And and you know, and I'll tell you as well that, that uh, it was a good thing for me because uh, I wound up getting uh, uh, retaining three and a half percent of the film, not for shooting it. I didn't get a piece of the percentage for shooting the film, but I got a one eighth of the backing of the finder's fee share. Oh, okay. <laughs> Basically what Toby and Kim did was they divided it up into thirds, one third for themselves, for the, the, the idea that they, the script and the idea that they had, 
and and one third for the uh, backers who backed it, backed it, and one for, third for the people who found the backing because finding the backing was as important as having the money. Absolutely. You know, to, to, to us, you know, to find it was as good as having it. So, uh, so that's been a nice little thing as well. And Absolutely, was, yeah. Not many people have that, that, as well as having a title that's an incredible title that opens doors and, you know, but also to have uh, something that, the gift that keeps giving too, you know, it's just, you know, it keeps paying, paying, the check keep rolling in. Check keep rolling in. Never, <laughs> never gigantic. I mean, I think the biggest year ever was 25000 But still, nowadays, it's still probably... Six, seven, eight thousand dollars a year that comes in, and you know, you never know what's coming. My wife was always happy to receive it. And go shopping. <laughs> Those That's checks fun. are always so fun. Now, yeah. being a massive horror movie fan myself, I've studied this movie like inside out, and there's so many urban myths and stuff that I keep reading about the shooting of the movie. So, let's dive into that. Okay, what was the first day of set like? And having shot this movie, there isn't much reference points from older horror movies or slashers because that wasn't really a thing until later in the 80s what was your perspective like perspective going in day one like were you just happy to be there were you like did you have a vision that this is how i'm going to shoot it i need this focal lens let's let's get into that well we we had seen interestingly enough although i've never really been a person who who copies other people's work but there were two films that were sort of were interesting to us as much as anything as an economic model as much as a film model uh legend of boggy creek and night of the living dead uh were two films that that were that were going on but as far as lens choices and things i mean first of all uh, lens choices that was us you know just doing what we knew about the lenses ourselves right we didn't, emulate anybody else we just knew how to what the lenses did toby had a good idea of, of lenses and so did i from shooting so many student films and, and commercials so we knew how lenses worked um and angles uh what i will tell you is that this is before um uh video assist video assist doesn't exist in 1973 okay so okay. um only the cinematographer the camera operator is the only person who sees the exact shot as it's going down so um, you'll see that a lot of those uh, shots, compositions are, are, are my work. I'm the off camera operator, so I'm making those shots as, it, as we go. Uh, Toby obviously would check the shots before. Uh, on rare occasions, he, he decided he wanted to operate uh, mostly a handheld camera. He, he decided he wanted to do a bit of that on occasion. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes we'd both be shooting handheld at the same time. Sometimes we pass the camera back and forth between us uh, from shot to shot. So it just got something slightly different in the picture as well as the performance. We did another take. Um, but uh, uh, but without a video without video assist, the compositions really are the, the cinematographer's work to right. a great degree. And uh, I also, you know, it's funny, I thought I knew a lot about lighting uh, now, 47 years later, uh, 48 years later. Uh, in fact, I realized that I still don't know everything there is to know about lighting. Um, that's one of the great things about light is that it's, 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 it's forever entertaining. I mean, there's always there's something about light that can always catch your eye, something yeah. can always learn, something new about it. Mm -hmm. Different things are happening about it all the time. And that's only compounded by the fact what's, what's happening with lighting and the whole revolution of lighting today with LEDs and, and iPod, iPad control of the lights and yeah. color changing lights and dimming. And it's like crazy what we can do. There's so much control over it now. It's like a, so much control yeah. over it. It's phenomenal. Uh, uh, something maybe we shouldn't get into just yet. I'll, I'll speak about it. Uh, although, so we don't forget about it. Unfortunately, what all this control over the equipment does and, and the faster lenses and the fa more light sensitive cameras and all that stuff is that in producers' minds, the process should be faster. And you can even say, okay, yes, the process, even I can agree, the process should be faster. Mm -hmm. But what happens was there was a certain, something about the plotting a long process of filmmaking when it was filmed, where it went a little bit slower. Like typically nowadays, I have to fight to get 25 day schedule on a feature. When it was filmed, those same caliber of features would shoot 30 days. Right. So 
And that there right in itself is there's the the example of how okay why is it why are we doing 25 we used to do 30 oh it's a faster process okay but what happens with that faster process is that there were certain peripheral talents and and and, and um what uh departments i guess is the best way to put it it's not, not the word i was looking for but that have a chance to do something that have a chance to improve their situation mm -hmm. because of, it's a, because the process was a little bit slower. Okay. And I missed that in, in the process. And there was, a, there was an attention that everybody was divided and because it was a dollar a second to run a 35 millimeter motion picture camera. Mm -hmm. So you just didn't flip it on wantonly. I mean, you only turn that thing on for real. Right. When you knew what you were shooting. Yeah. I mean, 60, 60 bucks a minute. You're not, you're not going to piss that away on a set. No one would. So there was quite a, a crescendo of, of people coming together and a preparedness and readiness and to, to shoot. And now the camera's on, everybody can see it. It's, it's little less of a, of a focus of attention, in my opinion, than there used to be. And so I do, I do kind of miss that part of it. Uh, mm. I sorry that I digress. You want to get back to yeah. So go back to the 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 the, the, the um, urban myth of Texas. Chainsaw urban myth, like so, like let's start with like the first day on set. What was the energy like on set? And especially seeing Gunner in his full costume for the first time. You got chainsaws. Describe that feeling, dude. I'm an old hippie. Expect me to remember the first day on set. <laughs> The first, let's say the first week or first okay. original month of shooting. You know right? what said about the 60s and the 70s? If you can remember, you weren't there. No. Um, uh, well, first of all, I don't want to, I don't want to, uh, you know, or spoil your, your your drama here, but um, uh, we didn't shoot Gunner on the first day. Uh, we don't shoot Gunner for a while. Uh, we started out, to the best of my recollection, I believe we started out shooting in the van. And okay. And we don't go to the house for for a while. Uh, uh, it, here's here's something you can contribute to the urban myth. I mean, uh, when we are at the house, we're shooting at the house for like on the, on the second day. And uh, this guy who owned the house, he comes up to me, and he goes, uh, "So uh, you seem like I think his name was Rocky, by the way, I think something like that." He goes, um, "He goes by the way, he goes." Uh, you look like you're a guy who might know what's going on from you ever watching. You seem like you're, you know, you know what's going on around here. So you guys are out here after tomorrow, right? And I go, what do you mean we're out here after tomorrow? He goes, well, they told me three days. They go, oh, man, we're here for three weeks. Goes, what the fuck? He goes, all right, well, you know, they're paying me by, I guess, my rates by the day. So, okay. He goes, but um, I guess I got to tell you before you guys find it, I've got an acre of marijuana growing back there and back behind the house. Mm -hmm. And uh, he goes, so um, please don't take any away. You guys can pick, pick it and dry it. If you want to smoke any, uh, you can, but, uh, but no, uh, you know, please don't take a lot and don't, don't, don't carry anything <laughs> off the premises. So, uh, um, but anyhow, that was, uh, we, we did one time, one, one morning, we did get high and uh, it was a disaster. And that I never, ever, ever again uh, mixed the two uh, marijuana and work uh, again, as long as I live. <laughs> oh, that's funny. And one thing that's so interesting about this movie is, again, just from my research about it is there seemed to be a lot of tension as the shoot went on with long hours and just people in the Texas heat. Can you oh, elaborate true. a little on that? Well, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 you can imagine, I mean, it's hot, it's hot as fuck, you know, oh. it's really hot, but like often we're shooting interiors with black uh, cloth on the windows, which is only making it hotter and we're just baking it in there. It's 1973, there's no air conditioning, right? You don't bring it right. nowadays, we bring in air conditioning units and big gigantic hoses, one foot diameter yeah. hoses, pumping, pumping cold air into a set. <laughs> um, that was absolutely not the case, uh, you know, in, in those days, it was hot. Food was rancid on the dinner scene. If the food was rotting Oof. right before our eyes, it stunk. Uh, Gunner, they wouldn't they wouldn't wash his clothes because they were afraid something oh, would right. happen to his clothes. <laughs> so he's wearing he stinks to high heaven, um, you know. And, and it's just it's just a, a you know a, a grueling, tough situation. We're working long hours. 
probably short turnaround. We don't even know what's supposed to be. We don't have any clue of how how little you know how much rest we're supposed to get. The union later on, mm -hmm. what, the union that's got rules, but we yeah. didn't have any rules. You know, it was just thought do whatever we're told. Um, so there was, you know, we we joked about uh, about it once. It, you know that the the massacre once it was called the massacre that we were the massacre behind the scenes was the massacre. You know that how hard it was, what a grueling, grueling situation it was for us to shoot. But you know, I mean, that all contributes to the to this weird energy of the film. I, I yeah, it, it definitely looks like it does because it adds to this like aura of this film where you just think of a movie called the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and if everything went according to plan, it would just be like, oh okay. But just by the name of that movie, it just sounds like it matches the production of it. <laughs> I can, I can tell you, not that anybody does it very often because it's pretty much known to be a jinx, but, you know, situation where you're the equivalent of going around high-fiving each other all the time about how great it's going, no. not the, the films don't work. Yeah, you know, I've heard of that one a lot. There's, there's chaos and tension. Depends on the kind of film, of course. But if you're making a horror film, what's wrong with chaos and tension? Nothing. That's what, it. that's what you want to get up on the screen. Might as well have it around the camera as well. Why not, right? Toby was a huge believer in chaos. Oddly enough, Russell Mulcahy, who was a huge fan of Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and it was the guy who brought me into music video because he was, mm. was the guy, also a big fan of chaos, would like to create chaos. I introduced two of them, they became buds immediately. <laughs> they, they were like, they, they loved each other, they were, they, you know, they were, great because it was all about this create this situation and the situation is somewhat out of control and in fact you know throughout my career I've sort of um you know worked for guys that are like that you know I guess I'm the right foil to those guys you know for those guys the, the guys that are into that this chaotic crazy situation where things can change in a moment I mean that's what the whole world of music video was just this crazy chaotic situation yeah. in the early days in the 80s i mean it settled down when, when the budget started getting bigger and bigger and bigger and we had to behave like adults <laughs> in the beginning you know well just, hey you know there's a skill with that like when there's chaos and you're forced to adapt not everyone can do that and uh just hearing about all your stories so far it just you're able to adapt to what's going on around you and that's a massive skill it's funny you know and i, I i've talked about that a little bit lately i've, I've been thinking about that and you know, it's, it has definitely has to do with my personality. My, you know, I was a left-handed person, so I believe that we all have difficulties learning to read initially because it's so counterintuitive to us. Yeah. And eventually we get over it, but it takes time. But, you know, we wind up a little bit behind, like, you know, my SAT scores, you know, I, was, I was 780 ver uh, math, right? But 520 verbal, to show you how, how out of balance I was wow. as, as, a, as a person when I was 16, 17 years old, when you take those tests. I mean, I did wind up taking them again for, I want to get into reason, but I took them again when I was 38 years old and I was, I, I got the exact same 1300 total, but I was 660 math and 640 verbal. So I, I got, I evened out later in evened life. Out a little. <laughs> yeah, but, um, <laughs> but uh, I think that I, I was not really a very uh, studio, not a really great student, a good test taker, uh, you know, not, not I wouldn't do my reports ahead of time like if I had a report to do I would stay up all night long the night before and, and mix you know, the two of us yeah <laughs> and you know so that all is, is sort of thinking back now contributes to me the sort of crazy guy who you know stands in crazy in in, in sometimes unfortunate situations and gets struck by lightning and goes oh wow here's the idea and you know and away we go and so yeah you're right to 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 sort of have keyed on in on that and that, that yeah definitely that's probably why i was such a a big force in music video uh because music video is like that totally i mean you don't know the artist may show up and go oh yeah by the way i didn't tell you the concept sucks i don't want to shoot that at all you go what you know what i'm gonna shoot or or you know or or you show up someplace and you know like the analogy i like to tell is if you're to go to the top of a mountain and there's a valley off to either side, right? And then in, in a commercial, and there's a beautiful bucolic valley, and it, the sun is raking across the 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 the, the 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 slopes, and there's cattle there, and it's just beautiful. It's just like you know, the most amazing bucolic scene you can imagine. You look off the other side, and there's lightning and tornadoes, and there's flooding, and trees are getting you know not tripped up. Well, 
commercial is going to shoot the valley. Music video is going to say, fuck that shit. Come on, we're going down here. And you go into the storm. You know, and you know, and in fact, Hype Williams one time actually took us into a storm knowing where to go to it, knowing we're going to be hit with a rainstorm. We had a hundred percent prediction of a rainstorm, and we still went to shoot where we did, knowing that the storm was coming. So, you know, uh, yeah, that that quick on my feet, absolutely. Very studious. No, maybe that's why, you know, I never went on to have a a, a, a glorious, I mean, yeah, I mean, I shot features, I shot, I don't know how many features, 20 probably, uh, you know, horror films, basically, uh, they were the high school comedies, I've done high school comedies in every decade that ever, since high school existed, and um, uh, every period decade, and uh, in horror films, so, but, you know, really where I, you know, uh, what I'm also known for, which is kind of odd, is, is commercials and, and especially music videos. Mm -hmm. You know, I've won, I've won awards in, 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 in those genres, the top awards. I won the AICP award, which is the top commercial yeah. you can win. I've got two MTV Moon Men, and you can see them behind me here. You know, one is one and there's the other. I see the other, yeah. <laughs> and you, you know, so, and that's just so interesting. Again, you're, you've got this lightning in a bottle about your style almost where it's like, throw me in the chaos and let's do it. And speaking about chaos, the character of Leatherface himself, uh, when you're shooting a character like that, and it's, it hasn't really been done as much at that time as some of the other movies in different genres. What was the vibe on set when you had Gunner going around with the chainsaw? Did you well, actually Gunner, use real chainsaws as well? Like, let's talk about that a little bit. There's actual chainsaw. <laughs> right and sometimes it had we had actual chainsaw with the these sort of gnarly hooks that are on a chain that uh, cut that do the cutting right that like, rip mm. through the wood yeah yeah and uh so we had that chainsaw with a proper now i don't even i don't even think we had two chainsaws to be honest with you oh uh, wow we may have been that low of a budget <laughs> um and uh we did have we could change the chain we had a chain with the hooks we had a chain without any hooks on it, and we and sometimes no chain. And when the chainsaw was running, you couldn't really tell the difference between you, visually. You couldn't tell, right, if the chain had hooks on it or not. Except, of course, when you held it up to something, it didn't cut the way it cut with hooks. Mm -hmm. You could cut through things. So, I doubt that we shot at all with no chain. There was really no reason to, right. Uh, although I guess in the in the chase, even to fall and hit with a running chain still would have ripped you up. So. Let's say, okay, sorry. I'm going to start over on this. Are you going to add Yeah, this? yeah, go for it. Let's hear it. Yeah, loving it, this. You know, it, it, I'm, I'm pretty certain that we wound up shooting with all three ways, with the possible ways with the chainsaw. With the chainsaw, with the regulation, uh, factory approved uh, cutting chain on it. Uh, uh, just the chain with no cutting teeth on it. Mm -hmm. uh, it was le less dangerous. And then at times, maybe no chainsaw at all. Uh, no chain on it at all because it was even more dangerous in case it was going to fall. Uh, you know, in case Gunner would fall or, right. or yeah. something like that. So, um, you know, we had uh, only one Gunner, so we couldn't afford to, have, and only one Maryland, so we couldn't afford to have either one of them get hurt, you know. So, right. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And one thing that's so interesting that I find about this entire movie and even generally anytime i speak to a director who's either shot a horror movie or has been part of a horror movie i always ask them this question when you're on set and you're trying to shoot these scenes that are, you're hoping would get an audience reaction of either a scare a jump scare some sort of high-end chase how do you know if it's working on set and does is there ever a way to find out it's working until you actually start editing the dailies or what's your perspective on that well you, you never really know for sure if anything works until it's edited and you put it in front of an audience mm -hmm. that's why every film will, will will have a preview screening with you know with with question cards and or, or remark cards for people and everybody yeah. and these people interview people because you never really know what works you think you know what it is but at the same time depending upon like you said if it's if it's a scare if it's a stunt or if it's something like that you can see it on playback now and you, you, you pretty well know if it works. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, there's no surefire way to do it. I mean, but something I can tell you that we did know from Chainsaw was, um, and it was, a, it was an epiphany moment for me too, followed up 
a few moments later, just like about 30 seconds later by the story I'm about to tell you. But when we were shooting the sequence after uh, Terry McMinn uh, has been has been hung on the meat hook. Yeah. And, and Gunnar takes the chainsaw. This is the first time we see the chainsaw, right? And he starts up the chainsaw and this blue smoke starts coming out of the chain. The smoke starts coming out of the chainsaw. And we're shooting across Bill Vale's body. Here, there's definitely no blade, no chain on the chainsaw because he's, he's moving around near his, mm -hmm. near him, right? And we don't want to hurt him with it. No blades for sure on the chainsaw at that point. And um, as I'm seeing this through the camera, I'm the only person seeing it. I'm going, oh my God, this is the <laughs> horrifying shit I've ever seen in my life. This is so fucking. You guys are pushing the envelope scary. definitely on that. <laughs> scary as I'm seeing it, right? And I'm watching it and I'm watching it as unfolding. And next thing I know, I start hearing a child screaming behind me. Oh, child no. screaming as loud as possible behind me <laughs> and they go, cut 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 and again uh my lifelong buddy or ever since i've been in college ted nicolau who was the sound recordist um his daughter karina had come to set with his wife uh sally and sally um sally was the uh the caterer the okay movie. yeah and so she had arrived to bring us lunch uh, that day. And um, the daughter got out and she happened, she happened to be walking around and happened to see, just walk past the door and see into that room where we're shooting that scene. Oh. And uh, it was, you know, it, it freaked her out. But of course, that yeah. was a pretty good indication that we were doing something pretty scary. <laughs> Well, there you go. That was uh, your test patient zero there. That guy can give you the screams there. Now, on the last subject of this specific, the original movie, there is that one, there's so many iconic shots, but the one iconic shot till this day is at the very end of the movie where you have Leatherface just flailing around with that chainsaw and it's used in so many posters, movie trip. Like it's just one of those shots that just lives on. Do you remember just that last, if I remember that shot? I remember yeah. I remember it very, very well. Yeah. So, can you break down exactly what the what your perspective first, from a filmmaker? What was uh, your idea of shooting that scene? Uh, first of all, um, I'm going to show you this this picture of somebody just asked me to autograph for them. I just realized. Oh wow! That, I just realized. But anyhow, you see? Can you see it? I it's, see it. I see it. Yeah. Over here in this light colored shirt, uh, shooting handheld. And oh, the other no way. is Ron Perryman, Lou Perryman's brother. Lou is my assistant. Ron came in on the last day. Ron was quite a good cinematographer as well. Living wow. In Texas, and he came in and, uh, and shot a B camera for us for the finale sequences. Anyhow, this shot here is taken at the instant, uh, at the time, the one take that led into the sequence you just asked about. Mm -hmm. So what, what happened was, as you see there, um, Marilyn is uh, character Sally is trying to climb into the pickup truck to make the getaway. Yeah. Uh, Leatherface uh, Gunner is li is limping over because he's just cut his like his, his leg or something, right? Yeah. He's just cut into the quad cluster of muscles in the thigh, mm -hmm. and um, he's limping over, and she gets in, and the and the, and the car speeds away. Well, what happens is Gunner proceeds to just go into this dance flailing yeah. he just starts flailing and i just go with him handheld and and uh and i i think that i'm being very safe because i'm shooting with an eight millimeter lens which is a wide angle lens which is giving me the this distorted wide point of view where i'm thinking i'm f further away i have the illusion Again, I can only see in the eyepiece. In the eyepiece, I'm seeing something quite fantastic, mm -hmm. which is like an out-of-body experience for you as a cinematographer. When you're seeing something great like that, you're no longer you're 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 there. You're in the viewfinder. You don't even exist as a person. You're just you're just you're in that, and you're oblivious to what's going on, other than what you're seeing. Yeah. And I'm on a wide-angle lens, so I'm trying to keep a good composition and I'm trying to keep the shot moving and going in and out. But at the same time, I'm not thinking about my personal safety at all. 
Gunner is flailing, something that he's just, you know, he's just come up with this, this frustration that, that, that he's portraying. Mm -hmm. He's flailing. And I'm not thinking about that he has, um, he's wearing his mask. So he has no peripheral vision because he's got this mask out in front of him. Kind of so covered his eyes, yeah. He's very cut down, right? And um, so as it's going on, I'm just thinking, this is great, great, great. You finally hear, cut, cut, cut. Everybody, you okay? You okay? Everybody's running in. Everybody, uh, everybody just thought that, that I had somehow been injured uh, in some way in the course of, of, uh, of shooting this, this particular shot because he was swinging the chainsaw. And it must have come so close to my head a couple of times that people just thought that I was, that I was uh, you know, that I'd been hit. Injured or something, yeah. And, of course, I had a very bushy, very curly, bushy head of hair in those days, so you wouldn't have seen the blood. Now, of course, anybody was worried that they would see right away if I was hit. But in those days, you wouldn't have known. So they were they were pretty confident that I'd been hurt. And um, they wouldn't – we wanted to do another take, and I go, no, no, this is too dangerous. We, You know, you got it, and it's, it's, that's going to be it. And um, what what I didn't know until, until much later was that – Toby was trying to stay close. I mean, that was one of the great things about the, the process before there was uh, video assist was that the director was always right near the lens. So mm -hmm. you could talk to him. Nowadays, the director's got a video village off someplace. Right, yeah. Sometimes has black, you can't even, can't even have a line of sight view to the set. The director can't even see, can only see the monitor, can't see the actual set. Mm -hmm. It's really difficult for communications. You can't talk to the guy. You have to, you know, it's hard um, to talk to him. Uh, in the old days, they were always right there. You know, you were you were off on the left, looking, standing from behind the lens. You'd be on the left side with a viewfinder. Your AC would be on the left side with a with to pull focus. Your assistant camera person, the AC, be there to pull focus, and the director would be on the right side, trying to get as close to the lens as they could to to see what was happening, to see the film as it was being captured. Uh, and uh, so Toby was along, followed along with me on this as I was shooting this. And Gunnar decided that he's going to try and take a swipe at Toby because this was his last, his last day of shooting. And he decided, oh, fuck it, man. And, it, and he just like, <laughs> he wasn't going to hit him, but he figured he'd try and scare Toby. So some of the one or two of those swipes is actually that everybody was thought I got hit was, was meant to be, was aimed to scare Toby. Just to give him a little oh, bit okay. of scare, you know, friendly scare, not to really <laughs> scare him, anything, but to make like, whoa, you know, something, something like that. You know. That's so awesome because this movie, in many ways, spearheaded the next generation of all these slasher films, whether it's Friday the 13th and Nightmare on Elm Street or all these other 80 movies uh, that came out. It had a massive impact on just the pop culture zeitgeist at the time. So mm -hmm. the movie comes out. It makes thirty million dollars. What's the first thing that comes to your mind after seeing it? And you're like, "Wait, this is this little movie we made in down in Texas, and now the way people are reacting to it." What was your going on in your head at the time? Oh my god, I I, I remember like it was phenomenal. First of all, you turn on a television, you're talking about it on the news. Is this film? You know, people are talking about it. Then you go. Uh, in a restaurant and you hear people talking about it and everywhere you go, everything you read, you pick up magazines. It's all about Texas Chainsaw Man. People are talking yeah. about it everywhere. Right. And I remember very clearly, I don't remember. I remember I was on the highway and I remember sitting there and sort of, I was driving, you start daydreaming a little bit while you're driving. Mm -hmm. And I started going like, Oh my God, like this, this film is a phenomenal, huge, big hit. And some people in their whole career, they never get this. What yeah. if I, what if I've like flashed here? What if, what if my, what if my first film is the only time that I ever have hit this this level of fame, fame and you know, and uh, a supposed fortune? But uh, what if what you know? What if it never happens again? What if lightning only strikes one time? Right. right. And uh, I, I thought about it a lot. You know, uh, fortunately, music video gave me a chance to sort of uh, to kill it again. And then mm -hmm. I did kill it again in, in commercials on Motorola commercials. But I killed it many times in music videos. And I got I got that same, you know. It's like when people when the film you make is, so, is people are talking about it everywhere. That's like the sweetest drug there is. There's nothing better. Oh, I, than that. I mean, you know, when you hear everybody talking about that was you killed that man. That was fantastic. You know, we love that shit. I mean, it was just it was perfect. I mean, that's just 
There's nothing better than that. Well, it's like the highest that, drug you can get, right? Yeah, Especially being it, a creative it, it, artist. It is. It is the the most satisfying moment you can have, and and but unfortunately, it's also an addictive thing. You want it, and you want yeah, it. You crave you it. You want, it, you want it, more and more. And, more. <laughs> and you want it again. And that's why I keep pop stars coming back at it. That's why I keep filmmakers keep coming back at it. You know, I, I wondered for a long time, why does Steven Spielberg keep making films? The guy's made so many great films. What the hell does he keep doing for? Because you want that again. You want, you, I can get that again, you know? And uh, so absolutely, uh, you know, I was concerned about it and fortunately was given the opportunity to, you know, I mean, uh, shot Billy Jean. I think, like everybody in the world seen Billy Jean. Legendary, yeah. The Roses, November Rain. Uh, police, Every Breath You Take. You know, I mean, these are... These are things that are, people go go bananas for them as well. Um, but at the same time, uh, I, I should mention, there's a question that's often asked. You didn't ask it, which is to your credit, but we're often asked. People ask us, uh, when you were shooting this, did you know that it was going to be this, you know, the film that it turned out to be? And like, no, I mean, we, well, we'd have to be a bunch of assholes to be sitting there going, you know, 48 <laughs> years later, people are going to be talking about this film like it was today. You know, I mean, it's like, no, I mean, you know, we no, we didn't. You know, yeah, of course. How can you, right? Well, the people ask the question, so that they they must think that you can. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, think, I think, I think, from an was, outsider's perspective, looking into someone like who's a creative artist who knows how difficult it is to get a movie up and running, filming a movie, going through the trenches, right. it's easier for someone on the other side to ask that, I guess, rather than someone who's been part of it. Yeah, I mean, but you know, so people ask. We ask that question invariably by people uh you know that, that, well did you guys know I, oh, how, how could we we would have been a bunch of assholes if, if we did feel that we that way about it you know that's yeah. a, that, that's it's so interesting and one thing that is even more interesting which i find is my introduction to this movie was the 2003 remake i was like i think nine or eight at the time and i knew it i was just um, I, way too young to be watching this movie i had older brothers so we loved horror movies and we just grew up in a house where we just went to the cinema and i i heard of daniel pearl as i was growing up from the 2003 movie and then when i started doing <laughs> research i'm like wait a second there's this 1974 73 movie that came out uh it's crazy and when that movie got brought up in 2003 when it released what was your original like touch point with the movie and marcus Nispel, who went on to direct the movie was it kind of like here we go again or how are you approached that movie well it's a it's a very long story how I actually Marcus of course I was shooting everything for him he's he was like my brother at the time I mean he and I were very very close uh, we're still in communications we're not not nearly as close as we used to be but 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 I shot everything he did for 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 years I mean initially I was one or four guys and I became three and two and I became the only guy for like twelve years I shot right, right. everything he did um, <clears throat> but uh, it's interesting because he fought hard for me to be the cinematographer on that film uh, because of a couple of things. One, one thing, one reason he had to fight is it's quite common if you're a first time director on a feature film, uh, it's quite common for the uh, producers to want to give you their cinematographer. Right. Uh, they, they, it's your, if it's your first feature, they don't, they don't trust you. I think it's wrong. I think they should trust the director. That's why they hired them in the first place, mm -hmm. but they often don't want to, they want the cinematographer to be their guy rather than the director's guy. It's a horrible thing that they're even thinking about it, but it's like it's, it's a, just the way the industry, I guess, works in some situations, guess, right? Let's think about it this way: it's a it's a cinema prenup. It's a, it's a, it's a way. <laughs> it's, it's a way to get out uh, without getting hurt if if you have to. Um, I guess uh, so, yeah. uh, anyhow, uh, um, so. There was that issue, which is what what Michael Bay's Platinum Dunes, those producers, Swarm and Fuller, were concerned about. Uh, and um, at the same time, uh, Marcus knew that because they had one year earlier, they had remade Psycho and it was a disaster. They made it shot for shot, matched it, and it was no, it was just bullshit. Yeah. So Marcus knew me very well and knew that I was the only person that would not try to somehow knock off the original. Yeah. Because I'd done it. 
you shot it. <laughs> oh, there's no reason for me to go there again. And so I was the one person he could trust would take us someplace new. And uh, I'm glad you saw that film. I'm glad you saw it first because I think that it's a it's a valid film as well. Oh, it's I a think great movie. Both, I think they're both really good films, and they're 29 years apart. And you know, the deja vu aspect was out the window. But they start, they tried to do that when I, I my first meeting that I had in te in Austin with the producers and with Marcus. They sit down and go, so it's going to be gritty and grainy like the original, right? And I go, I go, well, you guys want to shoot 16 millimeter? They go, are you fucking crazy? Are we going to go, we're going to call up Michael Bay and tell him his first Platinum Dunes production is 16 millimeter? I said, well, good, because I don't want to do that either. So I'm glad we're, we get past that. <laughs> On the same page. Uh, because, you know, I don't, I don't want to shoot it. No, I said, you guys want a gritty and grainy, but you don't want to shoot 16. And I'm telling you, you're not going to get gritty and grainy unless we shoot 16. So we can forget about gritty and grainy because that's been done. And I said, plus, you know, guys, this film, the remake is also taking place in 1973. Yeah. I said, why? I'm not even sure why we're remaking the film. I imagined up until like the point I got there, right? And they started to explain it to me. I imagined we were doing a 2002 version and there was going to be an Asian guy in the, in the van and an African-American in the van. Yeah, and there's going to be- Modern adaptation of it. There's going to be, you know, 2002 uh, soundtrack album release and all of that. And they go, no, no, we're making it in 73. And I said, well, then there's absolutely no, no point in shooting it to look like the original because there's nothing wrong with the original. Well, you know, I said, I said, well, look guys, here's the thing. I said, you know, in, in the 29 years, that have transpired since I photographed the original. Michael Bay, who's huge in music videos, Marcus Nispel, giant guy in music videos, yeah. myself, yeah. 12, 15 other people. We've lifted, we've elevated the visual aesthetic of the audience. The demographic that's gonna to come to this movie, they're the MTV generation. Yeah. And it's not the same. They don't, they don't expect to see a cinema verite, documentary looking, gritty, grainy, thing that's lit without a lot of style just lit for exposure like documentaries are lit they've got a different aesthetic than that right now. and they 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 looked at marcus from the floor and they go they go to mark well what does that mean and marcus goes he looks at me and go what does that mean i said y'all just gonna have to wait and see aren't you and and then marcus goes yeah that's what he told you you gotta wait and see so there it is and so yeah. that's uh <laughs> That's how we got into it. But you know, Marcus and I, uh, very, very uh, similar are, are how we feel about light. We feel very, very much the same way about light. And, uh, you know, so we don't, he and I didn't even need to talk. That's part of what, part for him, as well as the fact that we were close, that I was shooting everything for him anyhow, that he knew that I would, that I would not copy myself, that I would not knock it off. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he also, we had an unwritten communication, we, fast communication. We like the same things that have yeah. been well established over the years. And that's a smart thing to do when you're making a feature film, because no matter what film you're making, no matter what kind of film it is, it's always to some level, a bit of a race. You're always up against time. Yeah. You're always, you're always up. Time, always up. budget, schedules. Well, because budget, time and schedules, all three are the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. If we have more money, the only thing we do with more money in a film is be to buy more time to make the movie, get more crew to let us go faster, or get a piece of equipment that enables us to go faster. Interesting, it's interesting. But no matter what it is, time and money are the same exact resource in filmmaking. We just, mm -hmm. use, time. We just use money to buy more time. Yeah, on the last topic of this movie, when you're back behind the camera shooting this familiar character in this familiar setting, what was the biggest difference besides the, uh, of course, the budget and the technology at the time from your perspective, who was behind both films? What, it, what, it, what was it to you? To be honest with you, the, the, the workload, the pace, the, the, the stress of the getting it in the can felt identical to me, even wow. though one was $80,000 $80, and the other one was $8 million. So it was like, well, that's what, 100 times the budget? Yeah, pretty yeah, much, yeah. The budget. But a hundred times the problems as uh, as Biggie Small would say. <laughs> more money, more problems, right? You got a hundred times the budget, you got a hundred times the problems. So anyhow, um, uh, <laughs> more money, more problems. Uh, anyhow, <laughs> so, um, 
But you find uh, more people to please? Was there more pressure now felt, that you have the more budget it, to work with? Well, it felt the same. You know, I mean, I had uh, obviously I had to, I had to achieve at a higher level. I couldn't I couldn't you know I had I had to be now the 2002 version of Daniel Pearl and and deliver in that hot, that polished much more polished yeah. level than the 73 version of the guy who was just trying to get enough light and lighting wise just trying to get enough light to expose the image the compositions and the, the yeah. moves that's all strong stuff that I that's just a gift I think that I had from birth you know it's, it's a composition and the ability to design strong, excuse me, camera moves, but uh, lighting is. But now is a whole different thing. It had to have a, it had to have a good a good slick slick look to it. You know, it had to be. And what's interesting about it was, and one of the reasons I think that sold them in the end uh, to uh, to allow uh, allow me to shoot it for Marcus was that they're going look, this has to be a horror film. And it has to be beautiful. Mm -hmm. And Pearl does both of those things. He shoots divas and he shoots horror films. And it's got to, you know, Jessica Beale has got to be beautiful at all times. And and she is. She's great. I mean, she is she is she is not only a beautiful per beautiful, you know, appearing person, she's a beautiful, she's a beautiful person as well. She's yeah, just yeah. Uh, she's just wonderful, beautiful inside and out. Mm -hmm lastly just what's the legacy of this character and especially someone as yourself who's got his feet into both generations of this character what do you take away from the texas chainsaw massacre franchise wow well you know i mean there's there's something about you know look you think about it, your kid you know you're telling camp out stories you know or camping yeah. stories or right what are they they're always scary stories right so there's something about it that when we go into a dark place in a theater that we we like to be scared there's something about that you know to, that when you know i remember as a kid around you know eight nine years old if you're camping out it was told, told, told scary stories you know around mm -hmm. the camp yeah it's a universal so, feeling that we all crave right it is something that we crave and so you know it's, it's fantastic to have been involved with that you know, and uh, you know, I wonder. Of course, everyone has to wonder as things get weirder and weirder and weirder on a you know violence and, and crime and stuff yeah. like that. Do are we do we play some part in that? Well, you know, I, I, I hope, not, but I can't imagine that there isn't something copy copy you know crimes or copy whatever Influencing something yeah although fortunately uh not much has happened with chainsaws so uh but Bring you know, it on there, that. Is, there is a concern about well you know the people the, 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 are you should you show this film to the wrong crazy person and you create another killer um so there's yeah. that to concern about but at the same time believe it or not it was very much a political allegory and we thought the thing some of the shit we were shooting at the time was funny as we just thought it was hilarious some of this stuff i mean it was you know it was very much i mean look the vietnamese war you know we had the legacy of that going on we had you know the the, the whole thing going on with you know hippie movement you got what stock all that stuff going on it's interesting because you're probably one of the only people that will ever have that perspective of launching it and then relaunching it and mm. that's it's crazy because you have you know where it began and how you guys shot it at that time and now you're trying to reinvent it just even just forget the studio but as a creative artist as yourself you don't want to revisit what you did 30 29 years ago because then you've had this long growth of learning so many more skills and adding more repertoire to your tool right. belt it's your, one of the only people that can ever truly know what that feeling is what i can tell you was is that I did want to play the duality of that down, right? I thought to myself, how boring this would be if every five minutes I'm going, you know, in the original, you know, yeah, that'd just be terrible. So I said, I'm not going to talk about it at all. I was the only person that was back from the original, and <clears throat> and I decided I'm not going to talk about this at all. I'm just not going to bring it up. Mm, it's interesting. Uh, Jessica Beale did with her assistant. Uh, would take would invite me to come out for barbecue on some of the weekends and we'd eat barbecue and 
and uh, she'd have me tell stories about the original because she liked to hear stories about the original. It just made her feel, you know, simpatico with with uh, with the cat or with Marilyn's character. Right, right. Um, but uh, so she always wanted to hear stories about it all the time, as, as many stories as I could tell. She was happy to hear. Uh, but uh, other than that, I, I just decided I'm not going to be talking about this all the time. It'd be just super boring to everybody. Every go, oh, here we go, listen to this bullshit again. Except for when uh, when we're uh, in the scene where we're about to, the meat hook scene in the remake, uh, which is with uh, a male with Mike um, Vogel rather than um, Terry McMinn uh, in the original. Uh, and we're getting ready to shoot it. And they, they brought a winch in there and they've got a winch and a, and and they've got him all rigged up in a in in this in his thing, and they go okay, and they go show me the rehearsal. They go okay, here we go, and they turn. Eh, 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 it's going. It's going on, on. And, then, and then you get him, get him above the hook. And, eh, oh boy! <laughs> okay, he's in the hook. I go, are you guys kidding me? I said. This has to make people jump out of their seats. People, this has to land with force. Yeah. This has to come down. I said, this has to be a slam them out of the hook. They have to go, oh. Everybody I remember that, yeah. Oh. The audience has to go, oh, and feel it. You feel you know? it, yeah. You know, and I go, so here's how they go, well, what, you know, I said, this, this, this winch lifting him up. I said, first of all, another phase, Bernarski. He's got to be strong enough to pick Vogel up and put him back down, or he shouldn't be Leatherface. Yeah, because Leatherface has got to be that that strong. So I'm pretty sure he can do it. And I said, and what you do? And here's how we did it on the original. And on the original was even harder because Terry McMinn was wearing a halter top and cut off shorts, and we couldn't hardly show anything. Yeah. You know? So Dottie Pearl, my my first wife, who did a brilliant job of makeup on on the on that film and went on to become a great makeup artist. Uh, she designed the harness that basically they took like a parachute harness and cut it to just the, the two pieces that go through the crotch. Mm -hmm. There was a waistband that was good to go around the waist. So there's okay. the two loops for the legs to go through, right? And then a waistband. And then, so that caught you, that, that whole thing was hidden inside the shorts. And then up her back, because we're only going to see her from well, the way I shot it is I put the camera behind the hook with the hook in the foreground as he brings her over to the hook. Mm -hmm. That's classic. That's the way I line shots up all the time. I always, I'm always putting, it's the thing that I do all the time is I try to put okay. two elements, yeah. I try to stack elements into a shot. I don't like to have shot of this, shot of this, shot of that. I'll try to stack all three things in a shot if I can, right? That's how I like to, my- Gotcha, that's how you structure your shots. I like to, I like to structure these two, two important elements in the foreground and background. Something gotcha. that's of interest that you mm -hmm. know bring the story forward. So anyhow, I put the hook in the foreground, him bringing her to the, the you know Leatherface in the original, picking her up and marching, walking her over to the hook, right? And then we cut around front, right? Now everybody swears to God that you see the hook go into the back. Everybody swears to God that that's the case. <laughs> Anybody that's seen the movie, yeah, you, and you see the hook go into the back. Well, you don't. You don't see that, and I'll explain to that. Remind me to explain that to you in a second. Yeah, but. We cut around the front. Now she's got this very skimpy harness on under the short shorts, mm -hmm. right? And there's one one bit of harness strap going up to a, an O-ring. Actually, it's a D-ring, rather D-shaped ring that's sewn into this harness, right? Mm -hmm. And when we cut around and move the camera around the front, we've taken the hook, turned it around so that the hook is now facing away from her back, right? We've pre-threaded the D the D-ring onto the hook already so now he's holding her up high so the the hook is the ring is already in the, threaded onto the the d rings at the top of the harness is the d shape is already threaded onto the hook and connected to the lower part of the harness by a harness strap so that now you cut around the front he's holding her up high and he just brings it down and it's set the length of that strap is at the hook is so that the d ring is going to be right at the point in her back where we want that to go oh. in. We want the thing it goes in, so it pulls gotcha, her gotcha. down, and she is jerked as as the D ring comes down and hits the bottom of the of the curve in the hook and stops, can't descend any further, right? 
and she and her whole whole body is shook at that time mm -hmm. right? and, and that's you know that's why that works so effectively because she her body literally is shook right yeah and, 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 and you can see that in the scene where you can literally see that you see it you can definitely see it that's why it's so effective but yeah, so that's... stop and quick okay and and, and you know now we got to design this so now so now we know how to do it now build the harness for them we got the harness together quickly they had the harness here's the cutaway part of it you know similar deal to uh to to, to the original and uh, but they had the harness to already to rig him but we just changed it to a d-ring and and you know and put it on the hook and, and plant them on the hook the same way we did in the original mm -hmm. now something i wanted to speak to was that toby and i were in agreement on that scares right we're scarier two things i want to tell you about it mm -hmm. one is if we took people up to the point of violence but didn't graphically portray the violence gotcha that that was scarier than actually showing it right we kind of uh, fill in the blanks in our head ourselves as to what's going on or could be going our, on our belief was that everybody would fill in the blanks themselves and scare the shit of themselves in ways we couldn't even imagine because everybody true. would fuck themselves up everybody's own fears would come through mm -hmm. in a way that we couldn't possibly show especially in 1973 yeah we couldn't show that stuff so there's a lot a lot done there um there's also a lot done with the magician trick of misdirection right and the way that you really want to scare somebody is if you get them say there's a monster say leatherface or, or any kind of a monster going to make an entrance into a frame if mm -hmm. you can get the audience looking on the opposite side of the frame, right? Just like a, just like a magician. If I'm going to do a trick with this hand, I might do a floor. I go, da -da 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 -da. And meanwhile, I, would, I go like this with this hand and I throw a silk around or whatever. I've taken something out of my pocket and put it in my hand, and now I'm ready to do the magic trick. Well, it's a similar thing for us. We create a distraction on one side of the screen. You bring the character in from the other side of the screen, and when you get back and see the character in the shot, when you register that, they're already there. And that will mm. scare people. That will get people to, out That's of their seats. Right? So let's see, you get the misdirection looking over here, and you come back, and oh, fuck. You go over here, and oh, fuck. They're there. <laughs> this, yeah, it just catches you off guard a little bit. You're like, whoa, they're whoa. There. It's like they've just appeared out of nowhere. They've actually made an entrance, but perceptively, because, of you, because you've been misdirected to look over here, when you get back to there, they're in the frame so mm -hmm. that's something that we, we we chose to use very much so as well as well as you wrap up here with mr daniel pearl it is now time for a segment i call the final act mr pearl we're going to give you 15 rapid fire questions we just want the first thing that comes into your mind are you up for the challenge i guess so i'm i, I am <laughs> going to say yes i i, I probably i'm not going to be any good at this but let's see let's see what let's see what you'll happens. kill it What do you prefer more, movies or TV shows? Movies. Would you rather watch a movie at a movie theater or watch at home? That's a tough one. Um, depends on the film. Some films need to be seen in the big screens. Others are fine in, in the comfort of your home. All right. Favorite horror movie of all time, not including any of the Texas Chainsaw movies? Uh, Psycho. Psycho. Favorite horror villain, not named Leatherface? Hannibal Lecter. All right. What do you prefer more, summer or fall? Fall. Does pineapple belong on pizza? Absolutely not. Amen to that. What, did you, what do you prefer to watch more, the original or the remake? Like choosing between your babies here. <laughs> well, uh... I think that they're both uh, valid films. Uh, I, although the 4K uh, re-scan that Toby did on the original mm -hmm. gives it a pretty nice look. Uh, I do, I do happen to love the images of the of the remake. Mm -hmm. Really Absolutely. strong images, as far as I'm concerned. In, in my mind, it well, it, it, 
they, it could be the best looking film I ever, I've ever photographed a remake. Uh, although there are some who would argue that Pathfinder should have that distinction. Yeah, that's definitely up there. Do you like any of the Texas Chainsaw sequels? Any favorites out of any of them? Not really. Mm, ditto. <laughs> really, I've tried to do it, but they haven't really done it for me. I don't know. I'm sorry. Hey, uh, that's all I good. Apologize. I apologize to the guys who made the other ones, but uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, as I, um, The only two that have ever made big money are the two that I shot. So, facts are facts that's the, big, that's the big money ones <laughs> you got it any mementos that you still have from the set of the original movie no no what do you prefer shooting more other, other than i guess still got my own ass <laughs> <laughs> there I we go i haven't lost my ass oh, there we go. That's good. <laughs> yeah you know what i also don't have is my hair have you ever seen pictures of me shooting the original? I saw it. It's badass, man. You got the curls all over. <laughs> yeah. Oh, dude. I'm like, look at this guy. He's such a cool hipster guy. He's way ahead of his uh, jacker. That's, that's, that's what was going on at the time, you know? And, and then Marcus, one of the things, I mean, I just posted about it. I don't know if you've seen my Instagram post. I, um, Marcus always, uh, there's, a, there's a photograph of me in a book called Splatter Movies where mm. I'm setting baby legs in the, in, uh, for a shot out in the, uh, in the sunflower field that we had at the original uh, set location. And uh, I've got, you know, big curly, curly hair and mutton chops, mutton chop sideburns. So <laughs> can't grow a mustache yet and not, can't really grow anything here. I mm. usually grow my sideburns and, and but my sideburns are, are, are pretty decent actually. So, um, uh, but then of course on the hair app, as, as my daughter pointed out, when she found that picture in a book when she was about 11 years old, she goes, daddy, you're the hair opposite of you. Here's a picture of you and you're the hair opposite of yourself. You have hair everywhere. You don't have hair now and hair now where you don't, didn't have hair then. But anyhow, Marcus just always thought that picture was a hoot. He just thought it was the funniest shit. He'd love to show that picture to people, right? So he, when we're, when we're each introducing me to the cast of the remake, right? With Balfour and, and uh, Tucker, and the two, and he shows them the picture, and the two of them start laughing, and they start going, "I'm going to wear the glasses. I'm going to get the perm, and I'm going to grow the sideburns back and forth, right?" And the two of them, because they're going, "That's the shit. That's the '73." You know, I just just learned that we're doing it in '73, and they're going, "That's the, that's the look, man. That's that's the real deal. That's the real look of '73. Your look." Well, in the end, Balfour decided he was going to wear uh, the cap, right? Yeah. So that then put the perm and everything. It all went to to Jonathan uh, Tucker who went with the, the got, got a bit of a perm, although yeah, mine was real. real. Mine was real, I didn't, mine wasn't a perm, it was, mine was an Isro. Mm -hmm. That was my, you know, my, uh, my curly hair. And, uh, <laughs> and the, you know, and, uh, and I did wear glasses at the time, so those were my glasses. Uh, but um, yeah, Jonathan was not, didn't wear glasses, he got a perm and he, and he tried to grow his sideburns, but they didn't grow out sort of they just sort of went straight down they didn't sort of become lamp chops they're yeah they're like just strips you know, that's a, a nod to you like now that i think about it it's like that character looked awfully like something i saw when i was doing all my research with you and back in the day so that's awesome uh what you go on instagram you go to my instagram uh <laughs> deep pearl dp uh, on instagram it was the, la the last post I, I think it was the last thing i posted was that picture was that yeah is is me and the picture that marcus shows the story about him liking to tell it and then picture of Jonathan and, and Jonathan as, as he uh, assumed uh, my look. Oh, that's awesome. Hey, I got a couple more here. What do you prefer more since you shot both film or digital? Uh, I have to say, I hate to say it. A lot of people are going to get angry with me. Cinematographers going to get crazy with me for this, but uh, digital is is a good simplification of the process. It helps in a lot of ways. And, and because, you know, I got to say, let me, re, let me restate. If I was, if I was working on shoots that were, you know, 12 week shoots, 16 week shoots, these big, you know, 60, 80, yeah. hundred million dollar pictures, then I would say film. But if you're not on one of those schedules, you know, those big budgets with that kind of a schedule, then you're always in some sort of a race. Yeah. It's to go, 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 go. And digital just lets us go a lot faster. Now, mm -hmm. That's while I'm saying that, the reason that, that that is, is that 
well, all the technology today, you know, when I think of film, I actually have to think of film hand in hand with the technology of that time where the lights were bigger and better and they required, you know, more, you know, they weren't LEDs and yeah. LED requires one eighth the, the, the electricity that an equivalent tungsten light requires. So, and it's the heat. And so the sets were hot and it took more time. The fucking lights were bigger and heavier. That takes more men, you know, so everything about it is, is, is more and more and more of everything. Well, now you got a camera that's four times as light sensitive. Right. And you got you know, lenses that are two or three times or four times as light sensitive as, as light transmitting. You've got lights that are smaller. You've got um, a style that's come about too of, of you know, of uh, more contrasty uh, style, a more uh, different ratio of light between a key side and a fill side. Fill, fill side is darker mm -hmm. uh, the style. Um, so all of these things add up to make to make digital that much faster. So I got to say that because I can still paint pictures nicely digitally, I can still do a nice job lighting. I can still, and I still work. I don't use LUTs. I still work like I'm a, a film cameraman. I still mm -hmm. color my lights and do the things to the lighting and to the lens. If I, I don't use filters very often, but on the occasions when I do, I do this stuff in camera, you know, and on set because that's the way I've always been. So for me, uh, it's just, you know, it's just, it's just a, a little bit simpler and therefore a little bit faster yeah. process. And as I told you, we're all, if we had more money, what would we do with it? We'd buy more time. Well, if something is a piece of equipment that allows us to go faster, that's buying us more time. Yeah. Unfortunately, producers know that it allows us to go faster. So now they've taken that time away. The, the old 30 day schedule is now 25 days. Yeah. So it's a bit of a bit of a loss. I hear you. Uh, Lastly, describe Texas Chainsaw Massacre in one word. In one word. One word. Fuck. <laughs> Is that the word? <laughs> I mean, I don't know what else it would be other than somebody that's seen it. No. Uh, relentless. Relentless. Bam. Daniel, where can we find you online? Uh, on Instagram at, at D Pearl DP. It's D P E A R L D P. And uh, yeah, please do uh, find me there. And please do follow me there. If you're, uh, I post a lot of stuff about uh, Chainsaw, a lot of stuff about my music videos, uh, a lot of stuff about my commercials, and then a little bit about my personal life, only as it relates to you know, cinematographer's life, life of a cinematographer. It's kind of a blessed, blessed life. We get to see the world. We go around and people think of us as, well, they used to consider us geniuses. Um, uh, now a little bit less so. Um, and, I, and I'll to explain to you why. Uh, back when it was film, right? Well, mm -hmm. everybody had dated, so they thought they could cast. Everybody had written a short story, so they thought they could write. Everybody had decorated their apartments, so they thought they could be production designers, but not everybody could take a picture. Some people's pictures That's would come out black, nothing, out of focus blurs, white, nothing. You know, uh, there were a lot of things that you had to get right to get a picture that was usable, and not everybody could do it. So we were considered untouchable geniuses. This guy, we know the film's going to go into the laboratory. We're going to get it back whenever, and it's all going to be. It's all going to be there. It's all going to look good. It's all going to be there. And their guarantees, these you know, certain level of cinematographers, they're a guarantee that you have your project is in the can when you call a rap. You got it. Mm -hmm. And so we were respected for that. And a lot of you know, and and respected, you know, and I mean it, absolutely. Uh, now, hey, my phone takes a pretty good picture. How important are you? Yeah, everyone's a cinematographer now with just like our iPhones, our Samsungs. It's so everybody's a cinematographer. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. So yeah, that, yeah. That, the digital thing has changed that somewhat. So while it's brought certain good things, I mean, I can't make the kind of money I, I used to make uh, when it was filmed. When it was filmed, there were a lot fewer of us, many, yeah. maybe a, a tenth of the cinematographers that exist today. Mm -hmm. So we could we could demand, uh, you know. 
a lot more money or more of it uh, uh, pick and choose of our projects than right. today, that kind of thing. Absolutely. Daniel, thank you so much for being a guest on the show today. And thank you for your contributions to the creative arts. Uh, what this franchise has meant to me, it's got a very special place in my heart. And you, you, a large part of that is due to your amazing work and the things that I saw when I was way too young to be watching it. Uh, but <laughs> those are the things that stick with you. And uh, I, I truly wish you all the best in all your future work. And thank you for being such a trailblazer for the horror genre. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure. It's been fun to talk to you. It's been really good.